Do you see it, John? May need to do something. Okay. No, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. I think we have students admitted also, so we can get started. Well, are students admitted, I think? I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Now I see people being admitted. Okay, cool. Let me, let's give it a minute and then uh, we can get started. Okay, I think uh, we can get started now. Uh, okay, uh, welcome to lecture seven uh, of digital design and computer architecture. Uh, so far, you covered a lot of exciting stuff. And today we're going to talk about how to actually express what we have covered so far in terms of a, a language and uh, make sure that uh, we can actually uh, use that expression for good purposes, like verifying uh, what we have covered, combinational and sequential logic circuits, and also synthesizing what we have covered. So we're going to talk about hardware description languages, and specifically, we're going to cover Verilog. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, the, your, your textbook, Harris and Harris, covers another uh, language as well, VHDL. Uh, I personally uh, am more used to Verilog and like it, uh, although in general, there are no big differences between the languages other than syntax. OK, so these are some readings if you would like to do and follow them. Uh, today, we're going to cover hardware description language, as I said. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a dedicated chapter in Harris and Harris. And tomorrow, we're going to cover timing and verification in more detail than uh, what these chapters that I mentioned over here actually uh, cover. So by the end of this week, uh, we will be done with these chapters that I mentioned over here uh, at, the, at the bottom. And uh, next week, we're going to start the von Neumann model uh, and instructions at architecture, LC3 and MIPS, two different instructions at architecture. So here are uh, some readings uh, related to them. And then we're going to also talk about programming in assembly uh, using uh, the instructions at architectures. Uh, and this, this is the reading. And I will recommend, as I did before, that you read the digital building blocks chapter uh, from Harris and Harris, which talks about a lot of interesting digital building blocks, like adders, for example. We didn't go into a lot of detail in adders, if you remember. And I'd like to remind that uh, this uh, required lecture video, well, it's required, but it's really required if you want to get the extra credit. Uh, you can basically do it by April 5. Uh, and also the Moore's paper that I assigned last week in the recorded video. This assignment is true. Uh, this assignment holds for this semester also, because this is such a fundamental and seminal paper. Uh, that it's important, I think, for uh, a student starting in computer science and engineering uh, reads it and uh, reviews it. And it's only, as I mentioned, it's only two and a half pages. So it's a really good deal for 1% extra credit in the course. It may be the easiest 1% credit. Other than the questions that you get on the exam on Boolean algebra, for example, I think those are also quite easy. Uh, okay, and if, you're, uh, if you would like to know how to review the papers critically, you can actually look at some guidelines, slides, and videos that we, we provide uh, online. Okay, so today's agenda, uh, hardware description languages, and uh, we'll talk about why we need them and what we would like to do with them. And then we're going to talk about implementing different kinds of things that we covered in the past, combinational logic uh, and sequential logic uh, in Verilog. And then we're going to lead our way into timing and verification tomorrow. OK, and the Verilog slides, uh, we have constituted a tutorial. We will not cover clearly all aspects of a language, because this is similar to many software languages like C, Java, Python. Verilog is also a language, right? Uh, and uh, clearly, we cannot cover everything related to a language. You normally learn a language by doing, meaning by uh, implementing things in your assignments as you will do. And that's really the best way of learning. What I will cover here is some basics and fundamentals and some principles for good design, good hardware design using uh, hardware description languages. But 
uh, I will not go into a whole lot of detail. Uh, and all slides will be beneficial, especially for your labs, but also for uh, design principles uh, with hardware description languages. Okay, before I start, uh, I would like to cover a few slides that I injected into last uh, week's lecture on sequential logic that were not covered in the video. Uh, we remember last, uh, last lecture, lecture six, uh, was on sequential logic design. And uh, we discussed uh, how to uh, design uh, circuits that can remember uh, past inputs and past outputs, basically past things in general. Uh, and this consists of uh, some sequential elements uh, that, uh, store, that is essentially memory that store data, uh, data storage, and also some combinational elements that update that data and, uh, and provide inputs, for example, or provide the outputs, for example. That's, that's sequential logic. We will see that again. But one thing we did not cover uh, over there was you could actually do combinational functions using sequential logic elements like memory. And this is important to cover, I believe, because uh, a lot of the circuits that you see in your FPGAs are programmed using this sort of memory elements, also called lookup tables, that can implement logic functions. So to jog your memory, I'll start with this memory array that we discussed, right? Last time, uh, we talked about this bigger memory array. I mean, it's not that big, as you can see. It has four locations, two address bits lead to two to the power of two, uh, meaning four locations. And each location can store three bits over here. So this is our memory, right? And we constructed this memory from the ground up. If you remember, this is, the, uh, uh, this is our latch uh, we designed earlier uh, before constructing this memory. And we use a decoder to decode the address. And then we use a multiplexer to select uh, which address we're reading from, uh, uh, which row we're reading from, so that we can drive the appropriate uh, data out uh, in this data out uh, location. Okay, so this is memory, right? And it's uh, hopefully you remember exactly how it works. I'm not going to go into the details of how it works. You can write data into it. You can read data from it. This write enable enables you to write data to a given address that you're driving. And if you don't assert the write enable but give an address, then you can read the data from that address. Okay, now let's take a look at how we can perform Boolean logic functions using this memory array. So this is a very simple memory-based lookup table example. This is, uh, this is essentially the one bit uh, so, okay, imagine just this part of your memory. So I'm circling this uh, one bit line, if you will, uh, D2 element over here. Imagine we have only that part. We have the decoder, we have four, uh, uh, four rows in memory, and we have one bit line coming down. So that's what I actually extracted over here from directly your book also. Basically, this is a memory uh, element. Uh, this is, uh, this, it has four locations. Each location stores one bit, and you have one output Y. And in this case, they didn't really show the decoder. There's some way of driving this bit line using a decoder. It could be tri-state buffers, for example. It could be what, what we showed over here. It could be AND and OR gates. Uh, but imagine that it's being driven in some way. I think imagining that it's driven by a tri-state buffer is an easy one, for example. And that tri-state buffer is controlled by the address bits also uh, over here. So what we have over here is uh, two, imp two, uh, two bits of address that are input. And you can see that the data is stored in four different elements. And the data is stored in such a way that it's a function of the address. Meaning, if you want, to, if you want this memory to function as an AND gate, uh, for example, which is the case over here, what we do is uh, at address 0, 0, we store value 0. At address 0, 1, we store value 0. At address 1, 0, we store value 0. Only in address 1, 1, when both of the address bits are 1, we store the value one. Now, depending on the input combination we give to the address bits, we get an output. And that output is really a function of the address bits, right? So this is a memory structure that gives me, a, uh, that gives me an AND function of the address bits. So you can imagine, you can abstract this away. Don't think of this as a memory structure. Think of this as a cloud, let's say. I have two inputs, A and B, and I have one output Y. And this memory is really implementing the truth table of an AND function. So this is a very simple lookup table example. And you can actually generalize this to uh, any function, if you will. So a, a two, if you have a 2 to the n location, m bit memory, in this case, we have 2 to the 2 locations, 1 bit output memory. Uh, if you have 2 to the n location, m bit memory, you can perform any m in, n input, m output function, combinational logic function, uh, by ensuring that you actually uh, place uh, the right output bits in the right locations as a function of the address. 
So hopefully that's clear. Now you can actually imagine uh, coming up with different truth tables and different memories that implement different truth tables. Now this is called a lookup table. This has a special name. A lookup table is a memory array that's used to perform logic functions. And that's exactly what we have over here. So each address uh, that we have is a row in the truth table. And each data bit is a corresponding output value. Okay, so I'm not going to go into more details over here, but these lookup tables are commonly used in what you're going to program uh, do in your labs here in FPGAs. Uh, and uh, they, they enable programmable or reconfigurable logic functions. This way you can easily implement any logic function by just programming the lookup table, uh, meaning that you write, uh, you write, the, write, uh, you, you write the correct uh, uh, output bits to the right locations in memory such that you can, it can implement your function. Right? And this also enables easy integration of combination and sequ sequential logic in FPGA. So you can actually use this for sequential logic in FPGAs. So this is actually an example from your uh, Harris and Harris book, chapter 5.6.2, which shows how you can uh, have a programmable lookup table in FPGA with some more functions. For example, an FPGA provides a lookup table that uses four different inputs, as you can see, and one output over here. Uh, and uh, this uh, lookup table, uh, uh, depending on how you configure it, for example, uh, here you implement one function uh, that uses data one, data two, data three inputs, but not the data four input, meaning that you give uh, all x's, don't care, to so the data four input. You set it to zero in this case, for example. Uh, it doesn't matter. So basically, this is how you can uh, configure your lookup table. Uh, what happens is when you actually implement a function, uh, in an F, uh, in, in an F, uh, to be synthesized onto an FPGA, this, this bit stream gets transferred into the lookup table such that the lookup table stores the correct function as a function of the address. So the lookup table gets programmed by writing the uh, uh, right values to the right locations, correct locations uh, in the memory un underlying this lookup table. Okay, this is another example from your book. Again, this, this gives you a true input function of A and B one output function, uh, one output uh, that gives you y. So if you want to actually implement a function that has, uh, uh, that has three inputs, a, b, c, and one output, x, depends on a, b, c, and the other output depends on y, you use two lookup tables, as you can see over here uh, in this case. I'm not going to go into more detail over here, but based on the example that we have seen, now you know exactly how a truth table functions for an AND gate. You could do it for an OR gate, for example, and you could actually build more complicated functions uh, as well. So somebody's asking, why is there a MUX? Uh, basically, that enables you to connect different blocks in an FPGA. Uh, there's a MUX, is, if, as you can see over here, uh, that takes C. But it could also enable you to take some other input from some other block uh, com uh, coming from an FPGA so that you can actually choose between different inputs that go into the lookup table. That enables you to configure glo more globally between different uh, lookup tables and between different logic elements in your FPGA. That, that's true for the output over here. For example, you can select the output coming from somewhere else. It's not shown over here what it's connected to, but it's connected to somewhere in an FPGA. OK, so that was an aside. It took some time, but I thought it was important uh, to understand this concept. Uh, lookup tables are interesting because it enables you to use sequential elements to uh, implement combinational functions. And it's a combinational function because uh, there is nothing, uh, you don't really remember uh, what happens based on that function, right? Based on the function you, you execute. The, the memory elements are there to actually just store the outputs of the function. So it's really not a sequential uh, function that you're executing over there. Okay, so now let's go into hardware description language and Verilog, and you will see how uh, that uh, lookup table can be implemented in hardware description language as well later on. Okay, so clearly we're talking about uh, processors or different kinds of, let's say, uh, computational logic or memory. And this is one example. And things are getting uh, much more complex, uh, as we have discussed earlier. So this was 2017. At that time, uh, Intel introduced this Cabulate processor. Uh, I like using it over here, because I'm going to show something else from 2021. But this has four cores, eight threads, a reasonably deep pipeline, which we will talk about, a high fr clock frequency, and 1.75 billion transistors. So there's a lot of complexity. If you actually had to implement all of these transistors, well, OK, logic gates corresponding or uh, uh, using those transistors one by one, uh, you would probably go crazy as a designer. Right? And we don't want that. So we want, uh, we want abstraction levels as a designer so that we can write code at a much higher level of abstraction such that they eventually gets translated, get translated 
into transistors. We don't want to implement the transistors by hand, every single thing by hand clearly, especially when the numbers are like this. And, uh, and clearly, as I showed you Moore's law earlier, and you're going to read the paper, in about 47 to 50 years, there has been a 1 million fold growth in transistor count, and as well as performance at the same time. So this is a fast forward to 2021. This is Apple M1, as we have seen earlier. You can see that the core count has increased. It has diversified. You have four high performance cores, four efficient cores. GP means general purpose in this case. Eight core GPUs for some definition of core. 16 core neural engine, again, for some definition of core. Lots of cache, many caches, many memory channels, and 16 billion transistors. So it's an already an order of magnitude more transistors than 2017. So we don't want to implement this, these transistors or even gates one by one, right? Clearly. Now go, uh, go back to 2019 to a different level of scale. Uh, so uh, first of all, this is the largest GPU at the time. It's 21 billion transistors. As you can see, it's larger than Apple M1. But the Cerebras wafer scale engine is even larger, right? As we discussed, it basically takes a full wafer uh, and it gives you 1.2, uh, it, it enables 1.2 million transit, a trillion transistors, sorry. So clearly, uh, again, we're not going to uh, implement these one by one. So how, basically my point is uh, these chips are getting more, much more and more complex and dealing with this complexity is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, and uh, essentially hardware description languages enable us uh, a very good way of dealing with this complexity. Now, this was not different uh, 20 years ago also. Even 20 years ago, we had uh, millions of transistors, let's say. And at that time, it was still very important uh, to design at a higher abstraction level so that we don't need to deal with every single gate at the low level. But now, more than any time else, uh, any time before, we need uh, better tools and better abstraction levels going into the future. So what do we need and want? Basically, we want the ability to specify complex designs efficiently and in an abstract way. Uh, we want the ability to simulate their behavior, both functional and timing. We talked about functional uh, correctness before. We're going to talk about, uh, especially uh, about timing correctness tomorrow and a little bit about functional correctness. And uh, we would also like, uh, especially the ability to synthesize. Mean, what does this mean? This means that we would like uh, some tool to take our specification and automatically generate hardware uh, from it. Hopefully the entire uh, a chip, for example, usually it's not easy to do that, but at least some portions of the chip so that we don't have to deal with it by hand. And this, uh, this synthesis actually, hopefully the synthesis tools uh, are proven to be correct uh, in some way. And hopefully you have an error-free path to implementation because if you actually had to design everything by hand without specifying at a higher abstraction level, then you may actually also make errors. Whereas if you specify it with a hardware description language, and later a compiler takes it and synthesizes it into hardware, hopefully you get somebody gets the compiler completely correct. As a result, you don't have errors in your implementation. So basically, hardware description language enable all of the above. And these are, all of, uh, these are the needs and wants that we have, as, as, as I mentioned. Languages, these are essential languages designed to describe and specify hardware. In, in some sense, uh, it's, uh, they're not different from any other programming language. In fact, you could use them uh, as a substitute for C, Java, Python, et cetera, if you wish. There's no reason why you cannot do that, uh, actually. But of course, I wouldn't recommend that because these are specifically designed to describe hardware, as we will see later on also. Uh, the goal is really to enable a hardware designer uh, to specify what they want uh, be, from the hardware such that uh, eventually uh, you can simulate and synthesize uh, the resulting uh, hardware. Okay, uh, so we're going to get back to uh, this actually in a, uh, a little bit later also, uh, uh, the differences between hardware description language and other languages. Uh, so uh, they're similarly featured hardware description languages like Verilog and VHDL. Actually, they're very similar to each other. If you learn one, it's not hard to learn another. Similar to, in my opinion, many software programming languages also. If you know C, it's not that hard to learn Java. If you know C++, it's even easier to learn Java, in my opinion. Uh, Python is, of course, easier than maybe anything else, if you will. Uh, of course, it depends on what you feel, right? So basically, uh, it's not hard to translate uh, the knowledge of one to another. And Verilog and VHDL are very similar to each other in terms of what they can express. In fact, uh, you can express the same things with Verilog and VHDL, but the syntax is quite different, actually. Uh, personally, I like Verilog syntax better, but uh, again, that's a personal 
choice. And uh, mapping between languages is typically mechanical. So you can actually translate from very, translate a program written in Verilog to VHDL relatively easily, especially for the commonly used subset. But I'm not going to talk about that uh, in detail. So uh, essentially, there are two well-known hardware description languages. I'm going to talk about that. But I would like to mention one difference uh, uh, why we need a hardware description language. Why, we don't, why don't we use C or Java or something like that? This will become more clear later on when we talk about gates, for example, or when we talk about the gate descriptions in hardware. But basically, you want something that can describe the structures in hardware. There are two things, I think. You want something that describes the structures of the hardware, and you want something that enables a parallelism of hardware. So both of them are missing in more general purpose software programming languages. You cannot, uh, at least easily, describe the structures uh, of gates, uh, uh, AND gates, NOT gate, NOR gate, and even more complicated things using C, C++. You could do that to some level, no question about that. Uh, so that's one thing that's missing in uh, large, uh, software, uh, high-level software programming languages. But the second thing that's definitely missing, maybe you could get around the fact that you cannot specify AND gate or gate by building your own library. But the thing that is definitely missing, which is hard to get around, you could, you could actually get around that also, but it's just very hard to get around, is the parallels. Uh, meaning in hardware, whenever you have a signal, uh, multiple signals, let's say, or, or multiple gates, they concurrently operate, right? We want a language that specifies this concurrent or parallel operation uh, that goes on in hardware. Whereas if you look at C, Python, Java, et cetera, whatever your favorite language, they're very sequential, right? You don't have a construct that says, oh, uh, these things happen in parallel. I mean, you could, again, you could augment the language, but by nature, the language is not designed uh, to express that level of parallels. So actually, hardware people who, who know how to really describe hardware and design hardware are also very good software uh, engineers because they know exactly how parallelism works. If you actually learn how to describe hardware really well in this course, uh, you will know uh, the extent of parallelism because hardware is inherently parallel in nature, unless you make it sequential in some way by adding, let's say, uh, 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 um, sequential constructs in between, for example. But by nature, if you look at a combinational circuit, it's completely parallel, right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the signals traverse uh, the circuit in parallel. As a result, you have to think in parallel when you're actually designing your hardware and when you're describing your hardware. And the key thing in these two languages, at least the two well-known hardware description languages, there are many more than these two, is that they enable you to describe this parallelism and concurrency in hardware. Plus, they have uh, inherent support for hardware-level uh, gates and modules, et cetera, as we will see later. So keep this in mind. This parallelism is extremely important. Uh, you may have done some parallel programming, but hardware is going to be even more inherently parallel than what you have seen in parallel programming, for example. OK, so there are two of them, as I have named before. Verilog, I'm not going to go into more details. They're very similar. These are all developed in the 1980s by different entities, as you can see. And they're both IEEE standards, actually, uh, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, if you would like to know what IEEE stands for. But uh, they're standardized, so anyone can, uses them, uh, can use them. They're actually different standards. Uh, Verilog happens to be more popular in the US. Uh, VHDL uh, is, has another name, as you can see. Uh, even though that was also uh, developed in the US, it's uh, for some reasons more popular in Europe. Uh, and don't ask me why, it's just historical basically. In this course, we will use Verilog, but again, if you know one, it's very easy to use one. Now, I should also say that uh, these are standard vanilla versions of these languages. If you go to a hardware design company, which essentially all interesting companies today are doing hardware design, as we discussed earlier, right? Google is doing hardware design, Microsoft is doing hardware design. Amazon is doing hardware design. So essentially, I don't want to call hardware design. If you, do a comp if you go to a company that does hardware design, you will see that usually they use their own versions of hardware description languages uh, that have uh, things that are, that are more suitable for their needs and for their goals. So you may actually have a different type of Verilog or something that spawned off from Verilog, but they have a significantly extended version such that they can describe things that they really want to describe in the architectures that they're trying to build. So I keep in mind that what we're going to see is more standard, but uh, uh, the standard is really fundamental in the end. And uh, uh, you can, you can add, add more on top of it uh, so that you can customize the tool set and the uh, 
uh, and the description language that you have for your own purposes. Okay, so now let's jump into hardware design using HTL. Essentially, uh, one important principle is to do hierarchical design. Basically, we want to uh, design a hierarchy of modules so that we can control the complexity that we have and also uh, debug it more easily, et cetera. So basically, if you look, look at this picture over here, sorry about that, uh, the, you can see uh, there are some modules that are different from each other. There's a memory controller, there are different cores, there's a shared L3 cache, there are different things, queues on cores, IO. I'm not gonna go into detail clearly, but if you look inside the L3 cache, it consists of uh, some different modules also potentially, or an array of modules like memory. And then each module piece can consist of some combinational and sequential logic. And of course, how many is a good question over here. But basically, we want hierarchical design to ease our job. So we may start with some predefined primitive gates like and, or, not, et cetera. And simple modules are built by instantiating these gates to, for example, we can build components like muxes, multiplexers, like we have seen two lectures ago using ands and ors, and, uh, and the nots, of course. And complex modules are built by instantiating these simple modules, uh, again, in some fashion, right? And of course, you can instantiate arrays of modules as well. So hierarchy is important because it controls complexity, as I said. It's analogous to the use of function, functions or methods in programming. So we clearly have function abstraction or method abstraction in programming. Uh, and uh, this hierarchy, uh, the modules are essentially implementing a function uh, that we want uh, to be described uh, for hardware design. And essentially we have uh, functions. So you can, you can instantiate a module, which is kind of similar to calling a function uh, in, in, in software. In hardware, calling a function is more like instantiating this module that implements that function, right? Uh, so we will see this uh, and it'll become more clear, but I don't see it's fundamentally different from any other software engineering practice uh, and method. Complexity is extremely important, of course, right? You're, uh, as I mentioned, we're dealing with uh, tens of billions of transistors and uh, that uh, is essentially billions of gates, right? And somehow we need to tame this complexity. We want to be able to describe it carefully. And we also want to be described in such a way that we can somehow control uh, the complexity of it. We're going to get back to it. But uh, if you describe it, uh, let's say, at, a, at an extremely high level, such that the synthesis tools are not good at uh, providing you an efficient hardware, then you may actually end up with lots of gates, lots more gates than actually you need because synthesis tools are not perfect as well. So basically we, saw, we have to somehow tame this complexity. To tame this complexity, we have a hierarchical design, but while you're doing hierarchical design, you still need to be cognizant in terms of what you put into each module as we will see later on. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. This is, uh, uh, in a sense, this is not different from software design methodologies. You know, also in software design, uh, we have top-down design methodology and bottom-up design methodology, and we do have that in hardware description as well. So what does top-down mean? You first, we first, you first start with some top-level module and identify the sub-modules necessary to build the top modules, the top-level module. We will see examples of this later on, but this is a high-level example, right? So a top-level module, let's say, consists of three different sub-modules. And then you subdivide the submodules until you come to leaf cells. Leaf cells are circuit components that cannot be further divided. For example, a logic gate, or if you're using a cell library, uh, cell libraries are essentially libraries that you can instantiate uh, that someone has implemented. So for example, someone has implemented a great multiplexer. And you say you want to use a multiplexer and you don't want to deal with the lower level implementation of the multiplexer. You basically say, I'm going to stop at this level. I'm just going to instantiate this multiplexer because it's great. I know it's in this library. It has the characteristics that I want. It could be an adder, right? I, I want this adder and somebody did that adder for me. I'm not going to go into the gate level because that's, that's too much uh, design overhead for me. I'm just going to use this adder in this library. It could be many adders you have in the library. You pick one, right? It could be a cache. I mean, it could, you, could, you could actually say, okay, I like this cache design. It's in my library and I'm going to instantiate 64 kilobytes of it. I don't care uh, about the implementation, underlying implementation. That's my leaf cell. So basically, this leaf cell really depends on uh, what you consider to be, a, to be the lowest level of abstraction you want to deal with in your hardware description. And it could be logic gate, as I said, as, as low as logic gates. It could be a NOT gate, for example, your leaf cell. But if you actually do everything with a NOT gate, clearly your design productivity also goes down because uh, remember, we have billions of these gates uh, in, a, in a chip and they're increasing. Okay, so this is one way of designing uh, systems. For example, you can come up with a cache module, 
and then you can divide into controller module and a memory array module, uh, and then let's say an output module. And then you can, each of these sub-modules can be uh, uh, different things, right? Uh, when I say cache, think of it as memory. So memory has some controller, some uh, array, and some output module. And then array itself may have a decoder module and a multiplexer module, and then different pieces. So you can imagine different ways of subdividing uh, a circuit that you're given. OK, so there's also a bottom-up design methodology, which is exactly opposite. You first identify the building blocks that are available to you, leaf cells, and then you build bigger modules using these building blocks, sub-modules. And then these modules are used for high-level modules until we build the top-level module in the design, which leads to what we have shown earlier. So this really uh, is about how you go about designing things. And usually, whenever you design things, it's a combination of both. You first need to identify what your leaf cells are, and then that can drive things bottom up. But also, sometimes you drive things top down until you stop at the leaf cells. Usually, uh, good designs are done both top down and bottom up, in my opinion. OK, so now let's, say, let's take a look at how we define a module in Verilog. A module is the main building block in Verilog, essentially. We first need to define the name of the module. Whenever you're programming, for example, for your uh, assignments, uh, you will need to provide a name for the module. You need to give the directions of its ports. You, you, you basically say this, this module, this example module, has three inputs and two, one output, for example. You need to give names to the ports, A, B, C, input ports and Y output port, for example. And then you need to describe the functionality of the module. Essentially, this is what we did, if you will, when we talked about uh, combinational and sequential logic earlier. We described the functionality using truth tables, for example, or Boolean expressions, or pictures of gates uh, earlier. Uh, now we're going to do that in a programming language called Verilog. Uh, so let's take a look at this module, example module. Uh, this, I'm going to give you the syntax of it, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the syntax clearly. Uh, but you need the name of the module, as you can see. Uh, you, need the, you need to specify which ones are inputs over here. Uh, here you have A, B, C, Y, and then uh, A, B, C are specified as inputs, and Y is specified the output. And then you need to have an end module to make sure that uh, the compiler knows where to stop uh, when they're compiling uh, this module, right? And of course, the circuit description comes here, and we're going to see examples. Of it. And this is the definition of a module, essentially. And that's not the only way of doing it. Uh, well, I already said all of this. Name of the module, port list, input and outputs. And ports have a declared type, basically, whether they're inputs and outputs. And uh, that, uh, this is, uh, you, don't, you didn't need to put inputs and outputs inside the module. In fact, it's, it may be better to actually uh, name them like this. And when you, whenever you're defining the module, you can combine the name and the direction, like input and output over here. So these two codes are functionally completely identical, as you can see. It's just syntactically they're different. Again, it depends on uh, what kind of style you follow uh, or your company follows. Uh, it's always good to follow a consistent style in general so that you don't get surprised. Uh, because whenever you have surprises in programming, uh, in software design, or in hardware description design, uh, the surprises increase the probability of uh, a bug, let's say, being injected into your system. As long as you're following a, a consistent style with everybody else, the probability of bugs, at least due to these stylistic issues, uh, reduces. OK, so what if you have multiple bits uh, of input and output? You can clearly define multi-bit input and output. You have to. This is, this is called a bus, as we have seen before wires, essentially. You just need to give their range end and range start, as we will see. It's best to know, know these things with, with examples, basically. I can show you this picture, for example, on the slide, but it may not mean anything. Let's take a look at an example. So this is, for example, uh, A is uh, a 32-bit value. As you can see, it has uh, bit, uh, the most significant bit is 31. The least significant bit is 0. So we prefer to define it. Uh, 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 it, it basically, this, this is, so sorry, A, A is essentially a bus, multiple, multi bit input. Uh, so it's defined this way, basically. Uh, so I think that there is a bug over here. This should be, uh, yeah, this is fine, I think. Uh, so we, we prefer to define it actually this way 310A uh, is preferred over the 031A, which resembles an array definition. So there's, there's some confusion related to uh, which one comes first, 31 or 0, but we're, we're going to use this one, this definition over here. Uh, where the larger number comes on the left. And it's good to be consistent. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's good to be consistent with the representation of these multi-bit signals. You always use the larger value first, for example. OK, another example over here is B1 and B2, for example, two buses, 15-8, uh, 8-bit uh, value. 
uh, is B1, another 8-bit value that is 7 to 0, B2. And then you can later combine them in some way, as we will see in concatenation, for example. That's why we say 15 through 8 is over here, bits 7 through 0 is over here. But this means that this is really an 8-bit signal, and this is another 8-bit signal over here. And this is a single-bit signal, as you can see, if you don't have uh, this notation in front of it. OK, so hopefully this is relatively easy, and you will do a lot of this, actually, in your lab. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But basically, you can manipulate bits once you actually have these buses. Uh, this is also called bit slicing. Uh, Basically, you can assign partial buses. You can have a long bus that's 16 bits like this. Uh, sorry. Uh, you can, basically, you can declare as a wire, for example. Wire is something internal to the module. Now you can see that language has support for wires, for example, right? It's basically a bus uh, of 16 bits, 16 wires, essentially. Uh, this is another short bus, eight, eight, uh, eight wires or eight bits. And you can assign the short bus as an eight bit uh, portion of the long bus. Basically, I want long buses, bits 5 through 12, to be assigned to the short bus. OK, so that 8-bit part of the long bus gets uh, to be directed to the short bus, if you will. So this is bit slicing. You could, have, you could have actually taken individual bits of the long bus and concatenated them, as we will see in the next example. So you could do concatenation. So for example, you can assign y as, let's assume that you have declared a earlier, as we discussed, as, as a 4-bit bus or 4-bit wire. Uh, that has A's uh, second bit, A's one bit, A's second bit as the most significant bit, A's first bit as the next significant bit, A's zeroth bit as the next significant bit, and A's zeroth bit again as the least significant bit. So this is a four-bit value, as you can see. You can also do duplication. So uh, for example, this way you're defining multiple copies. X is getting A0, 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 which means that it's really getting four A0 like Y over here. So these are really equivalent uh, to each other. So this, this is a question of syntax again. And you'll learn it as you keep doing your uh, uh, labs. So very log is case sensitive. It's important to think about, uh, keep that in mind. So these two things, some name are not the same if they're different in their cases. Names cannot start with numbers. Uh, white space are ignored. Uh, so you can see comments over here. Single line comments are like this. Multi-line comments are like this. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the syntactic issues very quickly because you will learn them anyway. Uh, so there are two main styles. It, this is important. This is not syntactic. This is really uh, about uh, abstraction and thinking uh, So uh, and how you design, how you describe things. There are two main styles of uh, hardware description language implementation. You can specify your hardware in terms of structural level or gate level uh, or behavioral. Let's talk about structural. Structural is uh, where you define the module body as a gate level description of the circuit. And then you build up uh, a gate level into uh, larger level modules, let's say. Uh, you, can dis you describe how modules are interconnected, and each module contains other modules and instances, and then you end up with a gate level at the very bottom. And a module also describes the interconnections between those mo uh, modules as well, uh, or submodules, let's say. Uh, and then you describe a hierarchy of modules defined as gates at the very bottom level. OK, contrast this to behavioral. Behavioral is essentially uh, uh, the case where the module body contains a functional description of the circuit. This, cannot, this doesn't need to be gate level. You can basically an, have an if-else statement, uh, or you can, you can have a case statement, for example, as we will see uh, later on. Or you can have logical uh, fu uh, functions that are called. You can have a plus value that doesn't add, for example. And that's behavioral, basically. Behavioral, you specify, oh, this function uh, this, uh, this module is going to add A and B. It's A plus B. That's it. You don't go into the gate level, basically. So that's the difference between behavioral and structural. Uh, so behavioral can contain logical and mathematical operators. And level of abstraction is clearly higher than gate level in this case, because you don't go into the lower gate level, uh, which means that there are many possible gate level realizations of a behavioral description. So this gives some flexibility to the hardware description language synthesis tools but it also makes their life more complex. Whenever you describe things structurally, you're making things more specified in terms of how they should be synthesized, potentially. Of course, if you have a really intelligent hardware description language synthesis tool, it can basically figure out what you're doing in this function, and it can actually uh, implement a better function, even if you specified uh, better implementation of that function if you describe structurally. But behavioral, you're at a much higher level, and uh, the uh, the hardware description language synthesis tool can actually have many different possibilities in implementing or synthesizing your circuit. And uh, practical designs actually use a combination of both structural and behavioral 
Uh, and in our labs, we're going to use a combination of structural and behavioral. Uh, so, OK, let's start with the structural or gate level hardware description language. So this is an example module. Uh, I, see, I give you uh, the top module over here, and then uh, uh, sub modules of small that are exactly the same. Uh, and you can see that the top module has three inputs and one output. And the modules that are instantiated within that top module, I first and I second, have each have two inputs and one output. And they're connected this way, basically. So if you have this example module, uh, you can actually build a schematic. This is called a schematic, actually. Essentially, this is uh, a view of what the module looks like pictorially. Uh, and you can see that top is built from two instances of module small. Now let's take a look at how we describe in very long. So let's start with small, actually. Small looks like this, basically, A, B, Y, input A, B, and then output Y, as we discussed earlier, and then end module. And then we have a description of it. Top is the interesting part, because we're going to use two small modules over here. And we define inputs, outputs, and we define wire N1, because that's the only wire we really need to define and connect between the modules. Everything else is input or output, as you can see. And then uh, we basically name it top, of course, and we already named that small. I already said that. So basically, you first instantiate small once. And this is how we instantiate it. You basically call function small, let's say, or module small. And you basically connect input A to the A input of the module of, the, of, the, of small. Input uh, select to the B input of the module uh, of small. And input uh, and output Y, uh, which is uh, this one over here, output Y of the small, uh, sorry, output Y of the small uh, to this N1 wire. So basically, by inst instantiating means that you specify which inputs of the module, A, B, Y, uh, submodule, small, are connected to what inside the top module. And they could be some of the inputs, like A, B, or A, and select over here, and then out and an output, like N1 in this case. OK, now that's the instantiation of our first module, uh, first small module, let's say. And then we instantiate the second small module. So we just need to connect the wires appropriately again, right? So what do we do? So the A input of the second is connected to M1. So we basically take it from N1. So this is going to output M1, and this is going to take N1 as input. B input is connected to C over here. So we connect it to uh, the top level input C. And then Y output of the small module is connected to Y output of the top level module, as you can see. So hopefully this is simple. As you can see, it's almost obvious. Basically, you just need to connect uh, the instantiated modules, inputs, and outputs to the appropriate inputs and wires and outputs of uh, the top level module. And then now you can use this top level module to do the same thing, right, for a higher level module. Okay, and uh, this is one way, this was one way of doing it. And then there's a shorter way of module instantiation, as you can see. Uh, I just did this basically. Uh, instead of saying exactly, oh, my input, uh, my, my uh, wires A, B, Y are connected to A cell and N1. This explicitly, we did it implicitly. Now, the problem with this is now uh, pin order becomes very important. If you want to do this, you cannot basically say, put select as the first one and A as the next one, depending on what the module does, of course, internally. Uh, you really need to give the same order as the module expects uh, the inputs and outputs. So this is, again, prone to error. This is clearly a safer choice. You can order things in any way over here, for example. You can first say, oh, I'm going to connect the B input to C. I'm going to connect the output to Y. I'm going to connect the A input to M1. And then, because you explicitly specify everything, you don't need to be ordered that. Here, because you don't explicitly specify what input is connected to, what, uh, what, what input and outputs are connected to, what wires uh, inside the top level module, then uh, you need to specify the order. Okay. So basically, you need to be careful. If you actually do uh, the uh, smart thing, let's say, to save space in your program, uh, you, may, you may become more prone to bugs again. OK, and those bugs may be hard to identify also. OK, so short form in general is not good practice as it reduces code maintainability, uh, and you want code maintainability in general. Let's get, take a look at another example. So Verilog actually supports basic logic gates as predefined primitives. These primitives are instantiated like modules, except that they're predefined in Verilog and they do not need a module definition. So uh, for example, uh, this example instantiates the MUX uh, using not, and, and, or gates. So these primitives you don't need to define in Verilog because they're already given to you. So Verilog understands not, a simple not gate, as you can see. Verilog understands an AND gate. Verilog understands an OR gate as well. 
And this is the instantiate of MOX, as you can see over here. And you, this MOX you've seen before. I'm not going to go into the details of it uh, as we did earlier. But you have two data inputs, one select input and one output. And then uh, you, this, uh, this circuit uh, that is described over here essentially is translated into uh, the schematic. Or thought another way, you can use the schematic to describe the circuit using these knots and, and OR gates. right? And as you can see over here, uh, there's an implicit uh, ordering over here. This is the output and this is the input. Uh, again, uh, these are uh, the leftmost part is the output of the gates, and the other part, uh, the other uh, parameters to the gates are inputs uh, of the gates, as you can see. Okay, so this is a mux. Now you can actually build a mux using very log primitives, as you can see over here. Let's talk about behavioral HDL. So remember that behavioral HDL is functional description, not gate level description. So what we showed earlier is exactly gate level description, right? This is gate level, and this is also. Uh, structural gate level, even though we didn't show you the implementation of small, it's really structural uh, description because you're connecting uh, wires and modules over here. Whereas behavioral uh, is higher level abstraction, as we will see right now. Uh, this is a behavior example of a behavioral Verilog. I mean, it's, it just uh, gives you a silly example. In fact, in your book, I think it's called silly example or something like this is called your, a silly example. Don't worry about what the circuit is doing. It's doing some logical function, bitwise logical function, but it's not using any ands and ors uh, and uh, any, any gates, let's say. These are logical operators, as you can see. There are no gates here. There are logical operators. Uh, you have a not, you have an and, you have an or, sure, but they're all logical. You don't, you don't really connect wires, for example, over here. So this is behavioral. This is higher level, as you can see, compared to what we have seen with the mux. You could actually express the mux using this uh, behavioral uh, 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 description as well. Uh, not exactly the same, of course. So the, it basically, behavioral implementation still models the hardware circuit. So you could actually take this behavioral implementation, feed it through a hardware description language synthesis tool, and that could give you this. And I would give you this also, because that's ex essentially what this specifies uh, if you really directly translate it to the logic level. level. Uh, OK, somebody said, can the synthesizer minimize uh, our expressions? Absolutely. Potentially, yes. And that's a good synthesizer, basically. If it detects that your expressions are not minimal, uh, either behavioral or structural, then it can actually minimize those. Of course, uh, you may need to direct it to do that minimization. Uh, we're not going to talk about hardware synthesis because there are many, many goals in hardware synthesis. But yes, there are many goals that you can uh, give to a hardware synthesis tool, especially industrial grade hardware synthesis tools are actually quite stronger. OK, so I've already given you this implementation. You can study it on your own. But this is another example. Uh, these are bitwise operators and behavioral very long, right? This is behavioral. Uh, there are no gates here. Uh, there are no wires, if you will. Basically, we are using the assign statement to assign y1 to a and b. These are bitwise. And you can see and, or, xor, and and, and or are already defined bitwise operators. And you can see that these are five different two-input logic gates acting on four-bit buses. So I've introduced something else over here. Inputs are four bits over here, as you can see. a and b are four bits. Output are also four bits. So these are four bit bitwise functions. And basically, this is a schematic view of what we have seen over here, y1 through y5, if you will. And you can convince yourselves that they're correct. Uh, I'm not going to do that at this point, but it's, it's, it's very simple at this point since we've covered combinational logic in uh, detail in two lectures. OK, let's take a look at reduction operators. These are reduction operators and behavior of layer log. Basically, what this means is you take all of the bits and end them. Uh, this is an eight input A, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, wire, uh, eight, eight bit wire. And you take eight of these bits and end them and reduce it to a single bit. So, because Y is a single bit, as you can see. OK, it's much easier to write than this version, as you can see. And the uh, hardware implementation, uh, synthesized implementation, looks like this, basically. OK, so hopefully this is also clear. Uh, nothing really. Uh, Difficult here, in my opinion. OK, let's take a look at conditional assignment. Now we can actually do behavioral assignments in a conditional way. We don't need to use gates, muxes, selectors, et cetera. So this is a mux, actually. This is mux2, meaning two input mux uh, that has two four-bit inputs, one select input, and uh, one four-bit output. And as you know, the functionality of the mux is if select input is one, then the output is assigned to d1. Otherwise, the output is assigned to, to z0. So this is actually. A simple if-then-else statement, right? If S is true, 
I'll put y is equal to d1, otherwise y is equal to d0, okay? So this is also called a ternary operator. Uh, you see it in many languages, actually, this question mark, and then followed by the colon. Uh, it operates on three inputs, like a mux, a select input, and two data inputs, again. And this is our behavioral definition of the mux. So if you go back a, a little bit backwards, okay, this was our uh, structural definition of the mux, description of the mux. You can see that structural description is very gate level, not and, and, or, and you have to connect everything correctly. Whereas the behavioral description is already much nicer, right? Cleaner and shorter. And this can be synthesized to exactly the same thing that we have seen, or it could be synthesized to something else. It could be synthesized to tri-state buffers, for example, right? But I'm not going to talk about the synthesis at this point. And this is one example of synthesis uh, uh, thing that it gets synthesized to. So you can also do more complex conditional assignments. So you can actually do uh, nested ifs, for example. Uh, this is a four input mux. Uh, this is one way of specifying it behaviorally. If S1 is true, then you check S0 after that. And then each of these uh, uh, substatements of the ternary operator is actually a two input mux, as you can see over here. Again, I'm not going to go into details of this. You can easily convince yourself that this is uh, a four input mux. Okay, let's talk about the precedence of operations in Verilog. Uh, and uh, I kind of implicitly uh, gave some precedence to operators. So if you actually remember uh, this over here, yeah, this one, for example, the precedence is not, is higher precedence than and, and then and is higher precedence than or. That's why this thing works. Uh, if that was not true, then this thing could have been interpreted in many different ways clearly, right? But there is a precedence to the operators, not is higher precedence than and, and and is higher precedence than or. That's why you interpret this as not A and not B and not C, or with not uh, A and not B and not C, or with A and not B and C. Okay? That's why the gate level description looks like this. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all the precedence, but you can see the highest precedence is not, and then multiply, add, shift. So you can also see that these are operators that you can use in the behavioral Verilog. You could actually modulo, for example. You don't need to implement modulo using gates or divide using gates or multiply using gates. You can have behavioral uh, descriptions of those things that you want to do. Lowest is the ternary operator, as you can see, because you want to actually uh, have a higher precedence in the sub-expressions or sub-phrases of the ternary operator. Okay, let's talk about how to express numbers relatively quickly. I'm going to finish some part and then we're going to take a, a break uh, because these are relatively easy concepts. So hopefully they'll be easy. And we're going to talk about some more interesting concepts later on. So this is uh, how we express uh, an 8-bit num uh, number over here, as you can see. Uh, let's take a look at example. Basically, n is the number of bits. Uh, this b, uh, uh, okay, n express how many bits will be used to store the value. b is the base. Is it binary? Is it hexadecimal? Is it decimal? Is it octal? As you can see, this is binary. So this is an 8-bit binary number. And xx is essentially the number that comes after that, the value expressed in the base. So you can see that this is an 8-bit binary number, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Okay. You can also have invalid and floating values, as we uh, discussed earlier. Floating is what we discussed earlier. X is really not don't care in this case, but it's more invalid. Uh, and you need some have some invalid values uh, to operate on especially when you're simulating the circuit later on, as we will see. Uh, underscore can be improved, used to improve re readability, as you can see over here. Uh, again, nothing is really uh, difficult over here, as you can see. And this is one example, uh, uh, the different number representations of Verilog. For example, this is 32 bits default. So if you don't actually specify uh, uh, this, it, it defaults to 32 bits. If you don't give the uh, number, for example, as 8 or 32 or 4, it defaults to 32 bits, okay? And uh, you, don't, you, you don't need to give all the zeros also at the beginning. But if you want to give a 12-digit uh, hexadecimal number, FA3, uh, or 12-bit hexadecimal number, FA3, it's basically st is stored as 12 bits over here that correspond to F, A, and 3. Okay, uh, so floating signals, just as a reminder, uh, this is a signal that is not driven by any circuit. Uh, it could be open circuit or floating wire, also known as high impedance, high Z or tri-stated signals. We discussed already this, these slides. These are nothing new for you. Uh, and this is one example of the tri-state buffer uh, in uh, a very log. Basically, it's, uh, it's an, you have an enable signal. If enable signal is one, 
uh, the tri-state buffer's output is A. Otherwise, the tri-state buffer output is a four-bit Z floating signal. So this is how you can implement a tri-state buffer in Verilog, for example, to enable your lookup table, perhaps, right, as we discussed earlier. OK, we already discussed tri-state buffer. I'm not going to talk about this. If you're really interested, in, if, you, if, you've, if you did not uh, study it earlier, you can take a look at combinational logic lecture five. Uh, OK, uh, and we already discussed why they could be useful. These are uh, previous slides that we already covered. Remember this example where you may have, want to have CPU driving the bus or memory driving the bus, but not both of them driving the bus at the same time. Then you control the uh, enable signals of the tri-state buffers attached to CPU and memory appropriately uh, so that you can actually uh, uh, control who's driving the bus at a given time. Hopefully not both of them, right? You don't want to enable both of these tri-state buffers. Uh, OK, uh, this is another example directly from your book that shows essentially the same thing, but more sophisticated from a real system. Uh, and we're going to study exactly something like this later on when we talk about LC3. But a real systems are more complicated as you uh, no, also. So this is a truth table of an AND gate with Z and X. Uh, I just want to give it to you so that you can look at it. X means invalid. So anything, uh, if you have invalid, then the result will be uh, invalid unless you're really ending the invalid with zero. That's the only case where it's not invalid. And you can also have Z floating uh, as part of A and B. So these are the values A can take. These are the values B can take. And you can see that uh, 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 basically you can see the truth table of how z and x values behave. So if you end something with zero, you always get a zero, as you can see, right? So that's obvious. But uh, if you end something with a z and the other thing is not a zero, uh, you get an uh, x value, invalid value. That's true for x also, OK? So hopefully that's clear. Uh, this is an end, end gate extended with z and x as potential inputs, OK? Uh, there's some question, but I think it's already answered. So we get to parameters uh, to specify uh, whether you can instantiate a circuit with different uh, uh, width, let's say. Uh, but let's get to that when we get to it. So recall, we also discussed this truth table. This truth table also is not new to you, actually. When we discussed the priority circuit, you have inputs as requesters with priority levels and outputs with the grant signal for each requester. We said that you could reduce the truth table of that uh, with uh, to, to a truth table that has X values. But in this case, these are don't cares. Uh, they're not necessarily invalid values, basically. These are don't care. So keep in mind that this X over here is a don't care, but this X uh, over here that we discuss in Verilog is really an invalid. So don't confuse these two things uh, when you're doing uh, your truth tables versus when you're doing Verilog uh, design, if you will. OK, uh, let me finish this one, and then we're going to take a break. Basically, what happens with HDL code is important. There are two things that may happen, synthesis and simulation. And they're both important, as we discussed earlier. Right? Synthesis is also called hardware synthesis. Basically, we generate hardware. It, you could also call it hardware generation. Uh, essentially, you can have modern tools that are able to map the synthesizable hardware description language code into low-level cell libraries or gates. Uh, in the end, this is called a netlist, actually. A netlist. netlist actually gives you uh, uh, a uh, essentially the gates and how they're wired together with each other. It's a, it's a fancy name for gates and wires together, let's say. And this gets this is basically your hardware, just, uh, hardware specification, synthesized hardware in the end. Now, I say synthesizable HDL. Not all hardware description language code is synthesizable. If you actually use constructs that cannot be translated into low-level cell libraries or primitives, uh, then you cannot synthesize it, of course. Uh, for example, as we will see later on, you can write test bench code uh, or simulation code uh, in Verilog. They're not synthesizable. Uh, basically, you, you need to write code that can be synthesizable for if you would like it to be synthesized. So these synthesis tools can perform many optimizations to reduce latency, as we will discuss tomorrow, to reduce uh, size of the circuit, to reduce power consumption, et cetera. However, they cannot guarantee that a solution is optimal because it, the search space is very large, mainly due to uh, the computationally expensive placement and routing algorithms. And as the circuit becomes bigger, this placement and routing becomes even more complicated. And if you actually put different, even more constraints like power, frequency, uh, latency, uh, uh, and also circuit size, then it becomes very, very difficult. It becomes a multi-objective optimization problem uh, that is very hard to guarantee to be optimal. So if you really want these hardware synthesis tools to, be, uh, to produce what you want, meaning a circuit that's good, uh, for your standards, 
or for your goals, for your design point, let's put it that way, you need to describe your circuit in HTL in a nice to synthesize way. So I'm going to talk about that in the next slide briefly, uh, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail, meaning that you cannot basically add a lot of hardware into your circuit that uh, you, you basically think the hardware synthesis tool is going to optimize away. They may not be able to basically, because they have a lot of search space. If you start with something extremely suboptimal, uh, the, uh, the hardware synthesis tool may actually have a very difficult time to actually find a really good solution uh, for your design point. But Synthesis is the most common way of digital design these days. Most of the time, because of the complexity of the circuits, we want to synthesize as much as possible, but we also want that synthesis to be very, very good. Uh, so uh, the quality of your hardware description language code actually matters. So people have tried to, for example, synthesize hardware from C, C++, Java, high-level languages. It's a very good goal, but it's not very easy to get really efficient hardware out of it because, first of all, these hardware, these, these are languages, uh, high level languages are not designed to describe hardware in a nice way. Second of all, because of that, uh, they, they open up a huge space of optimization for the hardware synthesis tools. Uh, as a result, hardware synthesis tools are not uh, able to find the optimal points or best points in that space uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And sometimes uh, not even in an unreasonable amount of time, they cannot find that. Okay. The second reason uh, we use HDL code, the second thing that happens to HDL code is simulation. Basically, we simulate it. This allows the behavior of the circuit to be verified without actually manufacturing the circuit uh, by simulation, essentially. Simulators work, can work on structural or behavioral HDL. Basically, you apply inputs, and you get the outputs. And you can actually also have the timing. You can verify both functionality as well as the timing. You verify the functionality by looking at the outputs, by uh, exercising different inputs. And you look at the timing by looking at the waveforms, as I will show you in a little bit. And simulation is really essential for both functional and timing verification. Uh, there are other ways of verifying circuits, like formal verification. But with large circuits, they're actually very difficult to do. With small circuits, you may actually be able to do it. But with large circuits, simulation actually is very effective in general. OK, let's take a look at the silly example that we showed you earlier. Uh, the book calls it silly example. That's why. Uh, I call it silly example over here. But this is essentially the example that we showed. It does something. And this is the synthesis, basically. This is clearly a very low level of abstraction in your, uh, in your, uh, uh, in your structural uh, very log. And this gets directly synthesized to the corresponding uh, gates to the operators, as you can see over here. And if you want to simulate the example, you basically, uh, you basically use a tool like Vivado, for example, and apply input signals to it. And then you get a waveform diagram. Uh, and we will discuss later on how to simulate it. And your book also discussed that. And you will see many, many examples. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail uh, clearly in this uh, lecture. But you basically can look at the waveform and see when the signals are changing. Are they changing at appropriate times? You can actually insert delays to it. You can actually uh, check if you have the appropriate timing, et cetera, by actually manipulating the time at which the inputs arrive. and different gates behave in terms of how long they take, et cetera. So you could actually do very sophisticated simulation using your simulation tools. OK, uh, let me finish uh, with these two slides, and then we'll take a quick break. Uh, but this is very important, I think. Uh, and this is actually directly copied from your book. I'm going to read it. One of the most common mistakes for beginners is to think of HDL as a computer program rather than as a shorthand for describing digital hardware. If you do not know approximately what hardware your HDL should synthesize into, you probably won't like what you get, meaning it will be suboptimal. You might create far more hardware than is necessary, or you might write code that simulates correctly but cannot be implemented in hardware. Instead, think of your system in terms of blocks of combinational logic, registers, and finite state machines. Sketch these blocks on paper and show how they're connected before you start writing your code. So essentially, this is not a program. What we're doing with VHDL and Verilog is really describing hardware. That's why they're called the hardware description language. In the end, the goal is really describe the hardware so that you can synthesize it or simulate it, of course. But if you want to synthesize it, you've got to be careful, essentially. You cannot be extremely suboptimal, as I said earlier. OK, so what we've seen so far, we've seen describing structural hierarchies with Verilog, instantiating modules in another module. We've seen describing functionality using behavioral modeling. And we've seen writing simple logic equations and multiplexer functionality and describing constants, et cetera. But there is more. Uh, and we're going to take a look at that after the break. So I think at this point, uh, wow, uh, this, is, this took longer than expected. 
So let's take an eight minute break. I'm going to cut a little bit into the break because I want to finish. And these, these concepts are relatively easy in my opinion. Uh, so let's take an eight minute break and be back at uh, 1525. And in the meantime, I think there are some questions and maybe TAs and I can look at them uh, to answer. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, I think let's get started. I can see that uh, it's okay. It seems to be working. Okay, uh, remember you can always watch the lectures online at your own pace. They're all provided to you. Uh, uh, some people actually increase the speed of the lectures if they want. Some people can reduce it. Uh, so uh, if the breaks don't work out for you, there's a lot of flexibility in the course to do that. My, my goal in the course is to give you the ability to uh, absorb a lot of information. And some of it is not necessary. For example, the lecture we're going to cover tomorrow, uh, we've never asked a question on the exam. But I think it's important to cover that for uh, important uh, education. Uh, and for you to actually uh, uh, see uh, see how things are done in real life. Uh, so uh, sometimes I, I get quite excited about these topics and sometimes we uh, have shorter breaks than necessary. But uh, remember that you can always watch the uh, videos online. If you, you don't have to, as, as I mentioned earlier also, you don't have to attend the lectures as well. Uh, I think you will benefit uh, from attending the lectures that you're interested in attending, certainly. But for example, we cover very long examples here, and some of them are not necessary for everyone, in my opinion. Uh, hopefully, that gives you my uh, uh, philosophy. I think it's, uh, it's going to be hard to have a 15-minute break, for example, uh, in these lectures. Uh, but again, uh, you don't have to actually attend everything. Uh, and I, I've already said that, for example, tomorrow's lecture, if you don't care about the topic, you don't have to attend it. It's not, it's not really uh, something that I intend to ask about in an exam. And I've never asked it about, asked about it in an exam. But for those who find it beneficial, I think it's extremely important to know about timing and verification, for example. Uh, and also, you may uh, learn something that's really important uh, that may be useful for you 20 years down the road if you actually learn about timing and verification in the future, who knows? Uh, I've always approached my courses that way, even the most boring ones. And uh, I think it was actually, even though some of them were quite boring, in the end, I think uh, I learned, I would say, looking back 20 years ago. Uh, okay, uh, that said, I think the break was longer than uh, eight minutes in the end, uh, because I was doing something. Uh, but uh, let's start with uh, more very long examples. Uh, Essentially, we can write Verilog code in many different ways. Uh, and let's see how we can express the same functionality by developing uh, very low code at different levels of abstraction. Uh, one could be a very low level abstraction. And I think this is true for many programming languages, by the way. Whenever you're doing programming, you can use a very low level abstraction that could lead to poor readability. But uh, in the case of hardware description, that low level abstraction is nice for because it enables potentially more optimization opportunities for low level tools. Uh, or you could use a very high level abstraction, which gives you a very good readability. And that's true for software engineering also, actually. You, if you use high levels of abstraction and clearly define uh, things at a very high level, you don't go into a lot of low level uh, descriptions, let's say. You get better readability overall. Uh, of course, you need to have good documentation also, probably. But uh, it leads to limited optimization opportunities as well at the hardware description la layers. So let's take a look at comparing two numbers, for example. I think this is going to make the point very clear. Uh, you can define your own gates as new modules. And uh, we will use our gates to show the different ways of implementing a 4-bit comparator equality checker. In fact, we have seen this 4-bit comparator equality checker earlier in the combination logic lecture. I gave you four XNOR gates uh, to uh, see uh, how you can how you can uh, check the equality of two four-bit numbers. Essentially, it's two, it's four XNOR gates, right? Uh, and this is the XNOR gate. Uh, and this is the input A, B, Z, as you can see. Uh, this is a one-bit XNOR gate. And then this is an AND gate, as you can see. OK, and we, we basically uh, uh, define them as my XNOR and my AND. OK, and that's a module. And this is one way of implementing your equality check checker. And you can see that this is horrible uh, to read, right? I don't like reading it. I don't want to look at it even, right? Uh, you can see that there are four XNOR gates and then three AND gates over here. Uh, and you can convince yourself this is an equality checker. It is an equality checker. But basically, this is a lot of redundancy uh, at this very low level gate level implementation. So you could actually get rid of the last three using three assignment statements, basically make them behavioral. So these are AND gates, as you can see. We made them behavioral this way. Now, uh, they're uh, 
uh, still, uh, they're not end gates anymore. They're logical ends that could be uh, uh, synthesized into a structural ends, but uh, fine. At least they're more readable, right? I can read the C0 and C1 much more easily than this, uh, this module that I defined as my end over here. Okay. And then you can actually get rid of uh, the three assignments and combine them into a single assignment, as you can see over here, because you're really ending four bits over here, which are the four bits of the outputs, which are the outputs of the ignore, ignore gates. And that's your equal signal. And then you can also optimize, uh, you, can, you can actually make uh, use a short format of this. Basically, this is a reduction operation, as we've discussed earlier. You're re basically reducing four bits of C into a single bit uh, end of those four bits. And this is the short format of it. Basically, we got rid of three lines completely almost with a simple line. Now let's take a look at this part. That part you can also optimize away, right? Basically, using behavioral where log and bitwise operations, you can basically say C is equal to not, oh, sorry, not of XOR of A and B, which is really the XNOR. Okay. There's no XNOR operator. So we use not of XOR. If there was an XNOR, XNOR operator, we would have used XNOR directly, of course. Okay. So now this is two lines, but we can actually do even better. Now we can assign equal to if A equals B, we get one. Otherwise, we get zero. So this is clearly very short. If actually the language allows, you can actually get rid of even the uh, uh, even the uh, ternary operator over here. Okay, but clearly uh, we came to this much more readable code, behavioral code that's high level from this mess that we started with that was very low level. And this is the mess. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. Again, these concepts, this lecture is relatively easy, right? Uh, you can, uh, but uh, this also tells you something really fundamental in terms of how to develop uh, software uh, 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 how to do software engineering uh, and also hardware description uh, in the same sense, uh, in the same way. So this is more readable, both in software engineering and hardware description. The difference is here, you may not exactly get the gate level description, uh, the mess that we wrote earlier, right? If you put it, give it to a synthesis tool, the synthesis tool may give you something different from your my end and my XNOR gates and the way they're connected. Because it's optimizing away a higher, it's optimizing a higher level uh, function, if you will. Uh, so basically, you lose some control if you go higher level uh, when you're doing hardware synthesis. But that may not necessarily be a good thing. That may not necessarily be a bad thing, because uh, now your your optimizer can also potentially optimize uh, things better. But again, the downside could be that if it's too high level, then the optimizer may have too large of a space. In this case, it's not, of course, it's of course trivial, right? It's a very simple function. But imagine this being a very complicated function. If that, that complicated function may become relatively hard to synthesize uh, to an optimal level. Whereas if you actually provided the hardware gates like we have provided in this mess over here, maybe we could actually make this mess a little bit better, fine. Uh, but uh, if you actually provide the hardware gates, then the optimizer uh, usually doesn't have, it doesn't do something else than what you provided. Okay, so keep this in mind. There's a trade-off over here. Uh, the, the, a similar trade-off actually may, uh, may hold in higher level programming languages as well, right? Think of, think of optimizer or synthesis tool as a compiler. So the compiler here has a, a lot of choice. This is high level, right? The compiler can compile this into many different, uh, let's say type of instructions. Whereas here, the compiler has less of a choice, unless it's really trying to take that structural level up to up back to some other representation and then compile down from that representation, uh, it's not going to optimize a whole lot, basically. So think of uh, the hardware synthesis tool similar to a software compiler that compiles a high level language to a much lower level representation. Uh, okay. Okay, so basically we're talking about uh, writing more reusable very log code. And I'm gonna give you some principles as we go through. Uh, we have a module that can compare two four-bit numbers. What if the overall design, uh, in the overall design, we need to compare sometimes five-bit numbers, sometimes six-bit, sometimes n-bit. We really don't want to have modules uh, separately for each of these. And clearly writing code for each case looks tedious. It's just a, a, a unnecessary code bloat, let's say. So what could be a better way? Clearly, uh, parameterized modules is the example that fixes this problem. And Verilog uh, 
uh, has parameterized modules. You can define module parameters. This is one example. For example, this is your mux2. Uh, you can say you can define your parameter width, which really defines the data width of the mux. The data values can be uh, essentially width, and the default parameter is eight. Okay, uh, default sorry, default default width is eight. If you don't provide a width when you instantiate your mux, default is going to be eight bits. If you provide 64, it's going to be sele selecting between 64-bit input data values, OK? So essentially, you can set the parameters to different values when instantiating the module. It's very simple. Uh, and this is one example of it, basically. So if the parameter is not given, as I said, the default is assumed. So this is a uh, two, uh, two to one mux that operates on 8-bit data values, OK? Uh, this is a 12-bit uh, or two to one mux that operates with 12-bit data values. And this is a more verbose version of that same two to one mux that operates on 12-bit data values. OK, so again, hopefully this is simple. Uh, OK, uh, what about timing? So timing is also important. It's possible to define timing relations in Verilog, but they're only for simulation. So whenever you're testing, whenever you're running a test bench, for example, that is testing your module, you can say, OK, I'm going to assume a five nanosecond delay for this input, for this wire. I'm going to assume a 10 nanosecond delay for this gate, et cetera. And then your Vivado tool or whatever simulation framework that you're using to simulate your code uh, actually takes that. And basically, whenever it generates a waveform, it uses those values to delay the signals by the amount that you specify. That's the idea over here. So this enables you to simulate some timings. but this is not, uh, the goal of these are not really to uh, synthesize the timings. Uh, so timing, uh, basically the fact that you say this takes five nanoseconds uh, isn't necessarily true, right? Uh, because in the end, how long it takes for a gate or a wire is really determined by the hardware that you map this into. And that is determined by the uh, cell library that we discussed earlier. For example, you have a cell library that says this AND gate or this version of the AND gate takes two nanoseconds, right? This adder takes 10 nanoseconds. Whatever you say in your very low code doesn't matter at that point, right? You can say in your very low code, I'm going to assume this adder takes two nanoseconds. Well, that cannot be synthesized, sorry. In the end, the synthesis tool is going to work with the library and the library says this adder is 10 nanoseconds, okay? So basically, the define, timing relations that are defined are used for modeling delays in a circuit. And here's one example. And you will do this in your test benches, for example. You, you basically define a time scale, one nanosecond or one picosecond. And then uh, you define, basically, these are the delays, essentially. Uh, the inverted output here, this is an inverter, as you can see. The inverted output becomes available after five nanoseconds. But here, the, inverted, uh, the output uh, Z2 becomes available after nine nanoseconds. Here, we're basically simulating the inverter delay. Here, we're simulating the wire delay. And we just made it up, right? It takes five to nine nanoseconds. And you can see these nanoseconds appearing, assuming you have a correctly functioning simulation tool, it will respect these, nanos uh, these uh, nanoseconds. OK, there's more to come later today, actually, even more tomorrow when we talk about timing. Timing is really a fascinating topic. We have not touched on it so far, right? How long does a circuit take to actually produce the output? And it's really critical for high performance functionality, of course, right? Uh, how long does a circuit take to latch data, for example, or get the data available for the next clock cycle? This is really critical for how fast you can build systems with. So four gigahertz, for example, can you get to four gigahertz? It depends on how long your circuit takes to evaluate uh, the combinational logic between two latches, right? Between, or between two registers or D flip flops, as you've seen, and as we, you'll see in a little bit also. Okay, so timing is really, really important. Uh, don't think that it's not important. Uh, it's a fascinating concept. And I think it's really important if you, if you really want to build a high performance system, you really need to understand how timing operates. And we will discuss that uh, tomorrow. Okay, let me talk about some good practices. And then we're going to talk about sequential logic in Verilog, which is clearly important, right? So developing and using a consistent naming style is important. Uh, consistency is really uh, good for minimizing errors, minimizing bugs. And I think these are good practice for uh, software engineering as well. Well, in Verilog, use most significant bit to least significant bit ordering for buses, 31 to 0, for example, not 0 to 31. Uh, define one module per file. It makes managing your design hierarchy easier. Again, this is not written in stone. Sometimes it may make sense to have uh, multiple related modules in one file. Fine. Uh, 
but at least have some boundaries, basically. Don't put all of your design in, and uh, thousands of modules into a single file. That makes it really hard to uh, uh, manage things, right? Some, some modularity is really important in your file system structure uh, in addition to the mod module structure, right? Uh, and use the file name that equals the module name or at least the general class of modules name, right? And that makes sense, hopefully. And always keep in mind that Verilog describes hardware. That's why I mentioned multiple times that this is a hardware description language. You could use it as a programming language and you could develop software with it, but it would not be a good programming language for general, pro general purpose programming. It's really designed with hardware description in mind. Uh, okay, let me summarize the hardware description language for combination logic, and we're gonna step into sequential logic, which uh, brings even more excitement, of course, because you want combinational and sequential to build a real system, right? So we've seen an overview of Verilog, discussed structural and behavioral modeling. They're both very important, as we have seen, and they have different trade-offs associated with them. And we studied combinational logic constructs. Now we're gonna touch into sequential logic. Uh, okay, uh, so this is uh, just a reminder. Uh, remember that we covered sequential logic in lecture six, and we started with this picture. We basically said that you have a combinational circuit. This combinational circuit, uh, the output is a function of inputs, directly a function of inputs, basically. You don't remember anything. You don't remember past outputs, past inputs, anything. Whereas we add a storage element to this to make it uh, sequential. Now we can remember what we've done in the past. And that enables us to build circuits that remember with memory, right? And this is called a sequential circuit, combinational circuit plus storage elements. And the storage elements we built in the last lecture, if you remember D flip-flops, we had specific requirements from that storage element. We want the state to be uh, lashed at the rising edge of the clock or the falling edge, depending on how you're operating. And we want the, uh, the, uh, the state in, that store, in those storage elements to be available for the full clock cycle so that we have the entire clock cycle available for the combinational logic to operate and settle on. And we will see the timing aspects of it tomorrow. It's so critical, uh, but uh, uh, for now, uh, think that we want that entire clock cycle because we want, to use use we want to do useful work, which is the combinational logic in that entire clock cycle. Okay, so sequential logic in Verilog, uh, essentially we want to define blocks that have memory, flip-flops, latches, finite state machines, we said flip-flops are needed in sequential logic, but sometimes you actually want latches for different purposes also, uh, for, because you may not need the entire clock cycle in some cases, for example. Uh, and finite state machines, of course, we discussed, right? So sequential logic state transition is triggered by its clock signal, as we discussed last time. Uh, as we also discussed last time, latches are in general sensitive to the level of a signal, level of the signal, clock signal, whereas flip-flops can be built to be sensitive to the transitioning of the signal, meaning, the rising edge of the clock or the falling edge of the clock, as we discussed last time. And clearly, combinational logic or combinational HDL constructs are not sufficient to express, sufficient enough to express sequential logic. So we really need new language constructs uh, to uh, be present in Verilog or VHDL to enable this. And we're going to see two things, always blocks and pause edge and neg edge, positive edge and negative edge of a signal, specifying which edge of a signal you do something at. Okay, so it's going to be fun. So the always block is very simple, basically. So it's, 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 it's written like this, always at some sensitivity list, list of signals or list of events, let's say, you execute the statement. Basically, whenever this, this, this translates into whenever the event in the sensitivity list occurs, the statement is executed. And this enables us to latch a signal into a flip-flop at a given point in time, for example, whenever you have a positive edge of the clock. Okay, so this sensitivity list is very important then. We, we want to specify the sensitivity list correctly so that we, our sequential logic can operate correctly. Okay, so this is our D flip-flop. I've just given it to you. This is a four-bit uh, D flip-flop. It has a four-bit data input. Uh, it has a clock, of course. And it has a four-bit output Q, like we have seen. And basically, this is how you build it. It's very simple in Verilog. Always at the positive edge of the clock, uh, Q, gets assigned to D. And there's a special assignment over here. Uh, it's called a blocking assignment. We will see that later on. Uh, so don't worry about it right now, but we will see what this blocking means uh, later on. Uh, so Q gets assigned to D always at the positive edge of the clock. And that's essentially the behavior we want from a D flip-flop, if you remember. Whenever the clock rises, we want the data inputs to be assigned to 
the output of the flip-flop or latch into the flip-flop. And that is available until the next positive edge of the clock, right? This is essentially the behavior of the flip-flop. And it's very simple, as you can see. You cannot get this that easily in C, for example, <laughs> because the clock signal, how do you generate clock signal in C? And these are the hardware-specific aspects of uh, very long. So a pause edge defines a rising edge, as we discussed, transition from 0 to 1. That's the positive edge of the clock, rising edge of the clock, uh, if you remember. By the way, feel free to ask questions, because this is based on uh, stuff that we discussed in sequential logic. So if you have questions about sequential logic, we can handle them at this point as well. Uh, and the statement is executed when the clock signal rises. I mean, I, as I said earlier, positive edge of the clock. You could also have a negative edge triggered uh, flip-flop as well. You could basically say, always at negative edge of clock, do this. That will be triggering at the negative edge, OK? Uh, and once the clock signal arises in this particular case, the value of D is copied to Q, OK? And this can get synthesized to a different implementation of a D flip-flop with a hardware synthesis tool. So again, there might be different implementations. OK, so this assign statement is not used within an always block. Uh, this less than or equal to kind of assign statement is a non-blocking assignment. Later, we will see the difference between a blocking assignment and non-blocking assignment soon. And there's a question, what does reg mean? And I'm going to cover that next. <laughs> Don't worry. Basically, assigned variables need to be declared as reg. It's not a register, unfortunately. The name there does not necessarily mean that the value is a register, basically. It could be, but this doesn't, it doesn't have to be. So it's just, again, a syntax. It's a, in my opinion, it's unfortunate syntax. It should be called something else. Uh, but basically, whenever you're trying to assign some variable, you should declare it as a reg, OK? Uh, Again, this is different from a register. Register uh, uh, is something else like we discussed in sequential logic, right? It's basically, for example, you can have a register of uh, four flip-flops. That, uh, that, that gives you a four bits, right? Uh, I mean, in this case, it's also a register, I believe. But again, uh, uh, don't worry about that. It's, you think of this as a syntax. Uh, don't worry about the exact uh, reason for it at this point. So basically, someone is asking, so we don't have to define the gates needed to make a flip-flop? Absolutely not. This is your behavioral flip-flop, let's say. Of course, you could use gates to actually define the behavior of a flip-flop, but that will be your structural flip-flop, the flip-flop. Very good question, basically. Uh, you, could, you could also do it in gates, but now you can imagine that doing it in gates will be uh, a lot more work. <laughs> OK, let's talk about asynchronous and synchronous reset. This is not necessarily a very log concept, but this is more of a uh, uh, concept for designing flip-flops uh, that are resettable uh, at the start of a uh, at the start of a machine, for example. Uh, but I want to introduce it because you're going to use it in your labs, etc., and it's important. Uh, but uh, we're going to see how it's implemented in uh, Verilog also because they provide good examples of this always block and the sensitivity list. So our reset signals are used to initialize the hardware to a known state. Usually, resets is activated at system start. On power up, for example, the first thing the machine does is it resets itself. So there's a reset signal that gets routed to all of the hardware components. And they basically get reset to a known state or a known state that you really want to operate starting from. So there are two types of reset signal, asynchronous reset and synchronous reset. Uh, asynchronous means the reset signal is sampled independently of the clock, as we will see in an example. Reset gets the highest priority in this case. And this is sensitive to glitches, as we discussed uh, later on. We're going to discuss even more tomorrow. Uh, we discussed it in sequential logic a little bit, right? Uh, so that we developed the D flip-flop as opposed to using latches. Uh, but this may have metastability issues, basically. Uh, and we'll be, this will be discussed in lecture eight, which is tomorrow. Synchronous reset is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the example where the reset signal is sampled with respect to the clock. So you're not independent of the clock anymore. The reset should be active long enough to get sampled at the clock edge in this case. And this results in a completely synchronous circuit. So completely synchronous circuits are good because they're easier to reason about and you're, they're less sensitive to glitches. OK, let's take a look at the examples. So this is an example of a D flip-flop with asynchronous reset. So now there is not a, just a clock signal, but there's also a reset signal. Right? So basically, always at the positive edge of clock or negative edge of reset, we basically have this uh, statement. If reset is 0, Q gets assigned to 0. Otherwise, Q gets assigned to D. OK? So this is asynchronous reset because this block executes regardless of whatever the clock value is whenever you get a negative edge or falling edge of reset. Uh, 
Okay, basically in this example, two events can trigger the execution of this begin and end uh, block. A rising edge on the clock or a falling edge on reset. Okay, so this is asynchronous as you can see. Okay. Okay, and then begin and end for longer statements, a begin and an end pair can be used because now you're actually specifying much longer. Here, it was not really necessary, but it's a good idea to improve readability in general. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, we already showed that this is uh, with asynchronous reset. Okay, this should be, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, I think this is the same basically. Here, uh, I, I already described this basically. Here, this is asynchronous reset. You first check the reset. If reset is zero, queue is set to zero. Uh, this is asynchronous as the reset can happen independently of the clock, as we saw, uh, on the negative edge of the reset signal, right? And if there's no reset, then regular assignment takes effect over here, okay? Which makes sense, which is the else part basically over here. And that can be triggered uh, either at the negative edge of reset or positive edge of clock. But if you're at the negative edge of reset, that means that there is reset, right? So. This else is executed only at the positive edge of clock, basically. You can make sure of that. Okay, and now let's take a look at D flip flop with synchronous reset. So in this case, we don't have reset in the sensitivity list because we don't want to trigger anything. Uh, we don't want to trigger the execution of the statement uh, uh, when uh, for anything else other than the clock, basically. Only, we want to sample uh, the input only when we have a rising edge of the clock. Okay, that's so simple. This is synchronous now. Everything is synchronized to the clock. You cannot input a value to this D flip flop without, uh, uh, without actually uh, uh, going uh, uh, at, at any time other than the positive edge of the clock. Okay, always at the positive edge of clock, you execute the statement. The process sends to only to clock. Reset happens only when the clock rises, basically. And this is a synchronous reset. And then you still check the reset first. If the reset is zero, when the clock goes from zero to one, meaning rising edge, then uh, the output gets a zero value. Otherwise, the output gets the input D value, right? Okay, now let's take a look at a more complicated uh, D flip-flop uh, with asynchronous reset and synchronous enable, let's say, <laughs> okay? Uh, so you can see that uh, the sensitivity list is positive edge of clock and negative of reset. So you can see that this asynchronous reset, it's very similar to what we've seen earlier, but now we have an enable signal. So basically enable means uh, flip-flop gets the uh, value of the input only if it's really enabled, okay? So note that the enable signal is not in the sensitivity list in this case, meaning that it's not asynchronous. Enable signal is really synchronous to the clock, but the reset signal is asynchronous to the clock over here. Okay, and the, the way to read this is Q gets D only when clock is rising and enable is one. Okay, uh, so there's some question. Let me try to take a look at it. But in the example, the input is instantly propagated to the output, right? Whereas in our D flip flop last time, it took the negative edge, the clock edge to propagate to the slate. Oh, okay. So I think this is uh, this is something that uh, again, this is a behavioral description, right? You're thinking very structural at the lower level. If you think about the behavioral description of a D flip flop, it's exactly what I just described with very log over here. We don't we don't think about master or slave underlying how uh, how how the uh, D flip flop is implemented in the underlying circuitry or logic. But all we care about is at rising edge of the clock, I sample the value and that becomes available. What we gave you earlier was an, uh, a particular implementation of the D flip flop, actually. There could be many different implementations of the D flip flop. So this may not exactly behave like the particular implementation that we saw earlier. I, I, uh, I, uh, that, that could be true. But uh, this is still a D flip flop because it really enables you to do the thing at the positive edge of the clock, uh, do, the la uh, do the lashing of the input value at the positive edge of the clock. This is a very good question. So don't get confused with the lower level implementation from the behavioral uh, description of what a D flip flop is. Internally, uh, so what we have shown you earlier may not exactly match the behavior of what Verilog gives you. That is exactly true. That's, that's certainly possible. And also the, the don't get confused with the timing part. So here we don't specify any timing basically. All we specify here, if you go back uh, to this flip-flop, uh, yeah, this one over here, all we specify is whenever the positive edge of clock happens, Q gets D. Now this could actually take some time internally. And uh, it could actually be offset from the clock by half a clock cycle also potentially, right? That's all timing. That's all what we're going to cover tomorrow actually. <laughs> 
So this says nothing about the timing behavior of the circuit. Internal implementation determines the timing of when Q gets exactly assigned D, okay? But there, that's a very good point. Functionally, uh, if you simulate this without any timing, you will get at the positive edge of the clock, uh, D gets Q. But because of timing issues, we may have two problems as uh, depending on the implementation and the time. That's why I want to separate the timing from functional and we want to discuss timing tomorrow. Okay, that's actually a very good question. It's, it's really deeper than uh, uh, what I intended to cover. Okay, so we've already covered the enable and reset. Uh, so let's take a look at latch now. Let's, disc let's, let's, let's look at the difference between the latch and flip-flop. So this is a D latch. So D latch is implemented in uh, where log like this. Now, basically you're not sensitive only to the clock, but you're also sensitive to the D signal. So if clock is high, Q gets assigned D. So basically latch is transparent when clock is one. Now you can actually use this to implement the master slave D flip-flop that we discussed in the last lecture. And you will see, uh, and I, would, I, actually, I would actually suggest that you try it and see what kind of behavior you get by using two latches. You'll have to use the uh, inverted clock for the uh, slave, for example, in this case, and then you need to connect the latches in the right way. Okay, so basically uh, we've covered sequential statements. Sequential statements are, all, are within an always block. The sequential block is triggered with a change in the sensitivity list. Signals assigned with an always must be declared as reg, as I said, and reg is just a syntax. Don't think of it as register, it's just syntax. We use this non-blocking assignment signal, less than or equal to, I call it, but it's not less than or equal, it's just an assignment like that, non-blocking assignment, uh, and do not use assign within the always block. We used assign, for example, for wires. We use non-blocking signals, as we will see. So this is the basics of always blocks. So we, we have a standard wire assigned in always. Uh, we, where if something is assigned always, we uh, use a reg, signal over here. And you can see that this is the first flip-flop array over here. And this is a wire, simple assignment outside the always block. And whenever you do always block another second flip-flop, a second flip-flop array, you do a less than or equal to type of assignment, meaning non-blocking assignment. And you can have as many always blocks as needed, basically. And they all operate in parallel. So this is the beauty of it. This module completely operates in parallel, right? Okay. Uh, okay, now we may have the question actually, mm. I, I'm using special over here. Does it get the value over here or does it get the old value? Well, we'll see that in a little bit, basically. Okay, uh, so basically assignment to the same signal in different always blocks is not allowed. That's important, right? Uh, because then uh, there's no way to understand how the circuit will behave. Uh, okay, why does it always block remember? Let's take a look at uh, this over here. We go back to the, our the, the flip flop. This statement describes what happens to signal Q. Uh, but what happens when the clock is not rising? The value of Q is preserved, essentially. It's remembered, right? Uh, but it's not always true. So in this case, the value of Q is preserved because when the clock is not rising, you have the old value of Q. It doesn't get assigned, right? But an always block does not always remember. And you need to be careful of this. And uh, you may actually have combinational statements. So this statement, for example, describes what happens to signal result. So if invalid, uh, so you can, you can see the sensitivity list is triggered with invalid or data either of them may change uh, for this to execute. If invalid is uh, one, result is not data. Result gets not data. Otherwise, result gets data. But this happens when invalid changes or data changes. As a result, the circuit is combinational. There is no memory over here. Result is assigned a value in all cases of the if and else block uh, always. Basically, the data changes, invalid changes, uh, this uh, gets uh, assigned a value. So basically you can also use always blocks for combinational circuits. Always block defines a combinational logic if all outputs are always continuously updated and all right, uh, meaning all right-hand uh, side signals are in the sensitivity list. You can always, you can use always at star for short for this purpose. Uh, and all left-hand side signals get assigned in every possible condition of if and else and case blocks. And it's easy to make mistakes and unintentionally describe memorizing elements. So if you want to use always blocks for combinational circuits for convenience reasons, there are actually good reasons to use the always blocks to behaviorally define combinational circuits, but you may actually make mistakes. So you need to be careful so that you don't create unintentionally latches or memorizing elements. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Vivado most likely warns you in this case, but again, these tools are not necessarily perfect. Uh, so make sure you check the warning messages, but you make sure you actually understand the code that you're writing. Uh, 
more important. So all these blocks allow powerful combination logic statements like if, else, and case uh, over here. OK, let's take a look at some examples. Are these sequential or combinational? So is this sequential or combinational? Uh, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly since we don't have a lot of time. But basically, this is sequential. Why? Because if enable doesn't change, you don't have an assi assignment over here uh, for uh, out B. As a result, this is sequential. OK, what about this one? Uh, enable is not in the sensitiv uh, uh, sensitivity list. So as a result, this is also sequential. So they essentially, uh, here, even though enable is in the sensitivity list over here, look at the left one over here. Left one, enable is in the sensitivity list. Everything is in the sensitivity list. Output uh, doesn't change when enable changes. As a result, the circuit remembers right some past behavior. If you look at the right one, it, uh, the block is triggered only when data changes. Enable is not in the sensitivity list. As a result, this again is sequential because it's remembering the old value that was set due to enable. Okay, and you can try it on your own for Rivado, for example, and see. Okay, the always block is not always practical or nice. So, for example, this one uh, gives you a multiplexer combinational. This one also gives you a multiplexer, but I would prefer the second one in this case. Uh, clearly, always block is more work over here. Always at data inputs of the multiplexer and the select input. Whenever any input changes, if select is true, result gets assigned A. If otherwise, result gets assigned B. Well, that's a bit cumbersome, right? I would prefer the second one over here. OK, you can also do always block for case statements. For uh, this is an example over here. You basically do something different based on the value of data. Again, it triggers with any input over here. Uh, and you basically do uh, look at the different data values. If the data is all 0, the segments get assigned to this value. If the data is 1, you get assigned to this value. You could actually use, a, use this to build a decoder, for example, right? clearly. But this is not a decoder. This is something else over here. Because there's a default value also, right? which is anything else other than these values that are specified. So this is very handy, actually. OK, let me summarize the always block. If and else can be, uh, if then else statements can be always used in always blocks, uh, can only be used in always blocks. The always block is combinational only if all regs within the block are always assigned to, the sig uh, to a signal. And use a default case to make sure you do not forget an unimplemented case, which may otherwise result in a latch. I think this is really a good trick. This is how you can avoid combinational uh, or sequential blocks or latches in your always blocks. Use a default case if whenever you are using always blocks. And use the case x statement to be able to check for don't cares. Now let me talk about non-blocking and blocking assignments and circle what I wanted to uh, tell you earlier. So a non-blocking assignment looks like this. It's in an always block, as you can see. And non-blocking means that all assignments are made at the end. You execute the entire block, and all of the assignments, assignment A, assignment to B, are made at the very end over here. OK? That's the key distinction. All assignments are made in parallel. Process flow is not blocked. OK? So this is really important. This means that things are done at the end, whatever you do in the middle. So this, this A, for example, A gets assigned to two bits, uh, basically a, a bit value of one. B gets assigned to A. B gets assigned to the old value of A. It doesn't get assigned to uh, it, this statement, uh, essentially gets the value of A that is not updated by the statement. Makes sense, right? Because this is a non blocking assignment. All assignments that are done in the always block over here are really actually done right before the end statement, or assume that it's done at the end statement over here, which means that the second statement over here gets the old value of A. OK. Now contrast this with the blocking assignment. The blocking assignment looks like this, equal, not less than or equal. Essentially, A gets assigned to 1 immediately. After that statement, A is 1. And then B gets assigned to A. Now B takes the value of 1 as well. OK? So this is much more like a programming, sequential programming language, right? OK? Hopefully, this makes sense. Uh, uh, this is uh, very much similar to your sequential programming language that you're used to programming in. You execute one statement. You assume that that statement is executed, and you execute the next statement. Next statement actually gets the value that was generated by the previous statement. OK? Hopefully, that's clear. So this is more blocking assignments are more like sequential programming languages. Non-blocking assignments are essentially hardware. You want some register values, let's say, to be assigned at the end of the statement. And you don't want the old values to get affected. Then you use these non-blocking assignments. OK, so okay, blocking assignments, each assignment is made immediately. Process waits until the first assignment is complete. 
in other words, it blocks progress. Think of it that way, basically. Or think of it that, OK, this is my general sequential language, C, Java, whatever I would like to program in, and this looks like it. OK, let's take a look at an example of this blocking assignment. So if A changes to 1 over here, uh, essentially, uh, all values are updated in order, right? P, uh, so if A changes to 1, P gets 1. And then uh, A changes to 1, uh, G gets 0. And then uh, P gets assigned to 1 earlier, right? So S gets assigned to 1 because it's an XOR. Uh, and then this happens that way. OK, you, you, you can simulate this on your own. But basically, because of the equals over here, you sequentially execute this one. The result, of, uh, the result that you get in P affects this one over here. And the result that you get in G and P affects both of these over here. OK? Now, if you actually do these with non-blocking assignments, that's not the case, basically. The result that you get over P over here assigns at the end, which means that A XOR B over here doesn't affect uh, the value of S over here. That's true for A and B over here. It doesn't affect the value of here. And clearly, uh, the P and the G that you generate over here don't affect the value of C out over here. And again, you can simulate this on your own. Uh, basically, when S is being assigned, P is still 0 over here. OK, uh, I think uh, uh, since uh, later on, actually, later on, if, it, if you actually simulate the statement because you have the sensitivity list, anything is in the sensitivity list, because P changes later on, in the next iteration of this always block, uh, the process triggers again. Now you get the values of P and G and S and C out that were assigned earlier. And that, that is used as inputs for the next iteration, if you will. OK, so hopefully that's clear. <laughs> OK. So let me talk about the rules for a signal assignment. Basically, use always at positive edge clock and non-blocking assignments to model synchronous sequential logic. Uh, and I've already said this. Uh, this is all redundant, as you can see. And use continuous assignments to model simple combinational logic, which is this one. Uh, and uh, you can always use always at uh, sensitivity list continuing, uh, continu uh, uh, consisting of every input and blocking assignments to model more complicated combinational logic. Uh, but you cannot make assignments to the same signal in more than one always block uh, as, uh, or in a continuous assignment. So you can see. Uh, that this is not allowed, right? And uh, this is also not allowed, basically. You cannot update the same value multiple times. Now, we're going to look at finite state machines uh, and how to implement them. Uh, but I think I will uh, do that at the beginning of uh, next uh, class very quickly, because this is also very simple. Uh, and uh, you can also study this on your own, actually, because you're going to do this. But it's essentially going to be exactly the same as what we have seen so far. We're going to look at a circuit that looks like this and implement it in Verilog, but it's going to be easy. So I think at this point, uh, probably we should stop. Uh, if, if there are any burning questions, I will take it. Otherwise, uh, next class, we're going to cover timing and verification. But I'm going to take a very small, very short detour on these uh, finite state machine examples so that you don't miss out on this uh, example. OK, any burning questions? OK, I think uh, we're done then. Uh, see you tomorrow. And hopefully, uh, you're, you're, uh, this will be useful for your labs, because you will be doing these in your labs very quick, very soon.